Um, good morning, everybody. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to come here. And what I will be talking about this morning is uh, fetal programming and the role of prenatal growth and early growth in uh, the pathogenesis of several adult disorders. Um, I would like to start with a picture like this to take you briefly to the world of the honeybees. We know that the queens to become and the workers, they start their life with exactly the same genotype. The queen is living for up to six years. The workers live for something like six weeks. So the reason why the queen is so successful is really her first nutrition, something that's called the royal jelly. The royal jelly is, is believed or is even known to induce large epigenetic genetic changes associated with longevity and a larger body size. So maybe it's not only the genes, maybe there might be some other factors. Um, another example from the animal world, I will move into the human world after this, but is from uh, the group of Sue Osen and Nick Hales in Cambridge. Um, what they did in their study published some 10 years ago in Nature was that they studied mice. I'm sorry about the picture. I believe these are more rats than mice. But anyway, this was a mice study where they had a control group and then they had a so-called undernourished group. Uh, these mice were pregnant and during pregnancy, the mothers were fed with a low protein diet. Otherwise, this diet was isocaloric. So they got exactly the same amount of energy. There was only a reduction in the protein during pregnancy. When um, Sue and Nick studied the offspring of the control animals, they randomized them to two different groups. And the first group was fed an unhealthy diet symbolized by the McDonald's hamburgers. And the other group was fed a normal diet. So the diet influenced the longevity of this mice and the offspring, you can see that there was a 50-day difference in longevity. Um, but this is not that exciting. But if you go to this group, they did the same thing to the offspring of the mothers that were undernourished during pregnancy. You can see that there's a huge reduction in longevity among the offsprings, even if they got a decent diet after birth. They lived for about 200 days shorter. If they got a lousy diet after birth, they lived for about 250 days shorter. So by these two examples from the animal world, I would like, I just wanted to show you that early nutrition during early life or even during pregnancy might have very, very long lasting consequences. Um, David Barker was the person who took um, this work into the human world. And he put forward the so-called Barker hypothesis, where he suggested that coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and also hypertension originate already in prenatal life and mainly, mainly in response to maternal malnutrition. And this was mainly based on a study he did in Hertfordshire, and he was able to show that a low birth weight was associated with an increased risk for coronary heart disease, and this association was observed both in men and in women. We have been studying this in Helsinki for the past 15, 20 years, so welcome briefly to Helsinki. Just uh, to give you an idea of what kind of study cohort we have, I would like to share some uh, points with you. First of all, our cohort is born 1934 to 44, meaning that they are about 70 years old at the moment. And this also means that we have had the possibility to follow them retrospectively and longitudinally from birth based on findings in their birth records. Their growth is well documented in uh, <clears throat> child welfare clinic records and school healthcare records, and we do have data from various national records as well as clinical data. 
Um, you all know that Finland used to be a very, very dark spot on the world map in relation to coronary heart disease, and we started to focus on coronary heart disease in relation to early growth. What you see on this slide is really that a small body size at birth, this time expressed as a ponderal index at birth, is strongly associated with the risk for coronary heart disease. So you can see that there's a two-fold risk for these Finnish men to die from coronary heart disease is if they happen to be born small or thin compared to this other extreme. So in other words, I do believe that the atherosclerotic timeline really, really starts very early in life. Yesterday, there was some discussion about the importance of education, socioeconomical factors, and we know that there's an association between socioeconomical factors and coronary heart disease, and what you see here is that the offspring of fathers who belong to the lowest socioeconomical class had the highest risk for uh, coronary heart disease. But it's not this simple, unfortunately. If you divide these men according to their birth weight, you can see the well-known association between hazard ratio for coronary heart disease and socioeconomical status. Those belonging to the lowest socioeconomical group had by far the highest risk to die from coronary heart disease. But this was seen only in those men who were born small or thin. There was no such association among these men who were born with a higher ponderal index. So we do believe that there seems to be an interaction between socioeconomical factors and prenatal growth. We also know that maternal obesity has a massive influence on the offspring and the offspring health. Not only obesity, but also factors like preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, is largely influencing the later health of the offspring. This is, for example, illustrated here, where you can see that especially if a mother is obese, belonging to the birth weight group above 30, and if she gives birth to a child that's small, with a low ponderal index at birth, the risk for these people to develop coronary heart disease is two to threefold higher compared to the other extreme. Um, this is something that we just published a while ago, which received quite a lot of attention in the lay press. We were able to show that maternal hypertensive disorders during pregnancy was associated with cognitive function in the offspring when they were tested at age 20, as well when they were tested at age 70. So high blood pressure during pregnancy seemed to influence cognition in offspring, and it was also associated with a more rapid cognitive decline in this offspring. So is everything set? Is everything fixed already during fetal life, or does it make any difference how we grow later in childhood? Um, this is one way to try to answer this question. What you see on this slide is the hazard ratio for coronary heart disease in Finnish men in relation to early growth. So you can say that the worst place to be is right here in the back row. You are born with a body uh, ponderal index below 25, so you have an increased risk to develop coronary heart disease. But by far, the worst place to be is right here. Starting out with the small body size at birth, but ending up in the highest body mass index group at age 11. This is something that has been called mismatch. So in other words, there's a mismatch between your body size at birth and your body size later in childhood. And this is causing um, some uh, metabolic and other stress to the body, and which is increasing the risk to develop, for example, coronary heart disease. You can also look at the positive side of this picture. These men belong to the highest body mass index group at age 11, but they had no increased risk of coronary heart disease. They were born big, 
there was no mismatch between their body size at birth and their size later in life. So what could the explanation be? We have been studying, as I already mentioned, these people also in adult life, and what we have been able to show is that those individuals whose growth was like the one on the previous picture, they have by far the highest apolipoprotein B levels in adult life. So in other words, one explanation could be that there's a programming in liver lipid metabolism during fetal life, childhood, that is later predisposing to coronary heart disease. Um, a few words about type 2 diabetes, because type 2 diabetes is quite similar to coronary heart disease, a very common problem today worldwide. And we do see a similar pattern of growth among those people who develop type 2 diabetes when we compare them to the whole cohort. So they start out with a smaller body size at birth, they are thinner, smaller during infancy, and then they start to catch up and their weight and body mass index is above the average. Once again, we have to keep in mind that our study cohort was born 1934 to 44. So these children were not obese according to today's standard. Living in Finland in the 1940s, 1950s was not the best place to be in. So in other words, we still see the mismatch between early growth and growth later in childhood without any degree of obesity. So what about the roles of genes? How can we get the genes into this picture? We have been doing quite a few studies looking at various genes, but I just want to show one with you that we did a couple of years ago together with Leif Group from this city. And what you see here is the prevalence of type 2 diabetes according to birth weight and the risk alleles for type 2 diabetes. In those days, there were something like 14 or 15 known high-risk type 2 diabetes genes. So we divided the people into those who had a high number of risk alleles for type 2 diabetes. They were once again here in the back row. And you can see that even if you carried several high-risk alleles, you didn't have an increased risk for type 2 diabetes if you belong to this high birth weight group. Only those people who had these genetic risk factors but belong to this low birth weight group had by far an increased risk to develop type 2 diabetes. Okay, I'm well aware that high birth weight is a risk factor also for type 2 diabetes nowadays, but once again, our cohort is historical, meaning that, for example, nobody had gestational diabetes in Finland in those days. So probably this picture would look different today. A few words about blood pressure, since this is a symposium closely related to blood pressure. And what I have said about type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, also applies to blood pressure. We have quite a few studies on that also, but this is one of the studies that I wanted to share with you. First of all, what you see on this slide is really that those individuals, both men and women, who are born with a birth weight below 3 kilograms, they have a higher systolic blood pressure compared to those who are born with a higher birth weight. So the so-called Barker hypothesis is relevant also for mm, blood pressure. But the most exciting thing in this study was really that we could see that the association between birth weight and later blood pressure was modified by salt intake. So only those individuals who were born with a small birth size, low birth weight, were sensitive to salt. So depending on their salt intake, we could see an increase in systolic blood pressure in such a way that a <clears throat> one gram increase in, in salt was associated with a 2.5 millimeter mercury higher systolic blood pressure and up till intake of 10 gram. This association between salt intake 
and systolic blood pressure was not seen in those people born with a higher birth weight. So what else does early growth influence and do? Could it influence food choices, appetite? This is just one uh, snapshot from our studies in this field where we have been able to show that a low birth weight is, for example, associated with fruit intake. People who are born small eat less fruit. So a one kilogram increase in birth weight was associated with 500 gram bigger increase in fruit and berries in adult life. A few words about a slightly different story, but also the story about programming. <clears throat> During the Second World War, some 70,000 Finnish children were sent abroad as war children, mainly to Sweden. And <clears throat> some of these children are part of our cohort. And we have been looking at the influence of early life stress on later health. So what you see here is really that those individuals who were evacuated during childhood, they had a twofold increased risk for cardiovascular diseases and significantly higher risk to develop type 2 diabetes compared to those people who stayed at home in Finland and experienced the war in Helsinki. We have also shown that the timing of the evacuation is of importance, for example, in relation to birth, in relation to blood pressure. So those who were evacuated during early childhood seem to be those who got the highest blood pressure later in life. So what could the explanation behind these findings be in relation to the uh, <coughs> evacuations? We believe that people who experienced these evacuations, they experienced extreme early life stress. They were sent away from home to a country where they didn't know the language, and then they returned back again to their home country and they had probably forgotten the language. Some of these people went back and forth two times, three times, even four times. And uh, <clears throat> we have been looking at or studying these people in adult life at the age of 64 years. And we have look been looking at their HPA axis and their stress response. And you can see a huge difference in their stress response, both if you measure the salivary cortisol, looking at plasma cortisol or plasma ACTH. So probably these early life influences are reprogramming their stress responses, which might increase the risk for uh, coronary heart disease and hypertension later in life. So today we believe that there are critical periods in the human development, and many of them are during the first 1,000 days after conception. Each system and organ has a critical period, and if there is an insult taking place, it could affect different organs in a different way. So when I'm talking about programming, I'm not talking about a small body size at birth. That's how it started. But I'm talking about various aspects like maternal stress, nutrition, smoking, for example, placental dysfunction, which could program the organs in a different way. For example, the liver can be programmed in such a way that it's producing more atherogenic lipids. We know that a small body size at birth is associated with less muscle mass and an unfavorable fat distribution predisposing to type 2 diabetes. And I showed you among the war children that there seems to be a reprogramming of the HPA axis, as axis due to early life stress. Um, the underlying factors probably explaining most of these findings are epigenetic changes. So epigenetic changes are, as you know, extremely difficult to study. They are mostly tissue uh, specific, but still this could be the underlying cause why early nutrition, early growth really seems to be associated with later health. I would like to share with you just one study from the UK 
from the Southampton Women's Study done by the group of <coughs> Mark Hansen. They were following up pregnant women during pregnancy and before pregnancy. Um, the study group had very detailed information on nutrition. And what they were able to show was that maternal carbohydrate intake during the first trimester of pregnancy was associated with the methylation of the retinoid receptor X gene in the umbilical cord. So those mothers whose carbohydrate intake was low during the first trimester had the highest degree of methylation in this RXR gene. Okay, <clears throat> if we take this further, you can see that the methylation in this gene was very nicely associated with the fat mass in the offspring. When these offspring were studied at the age of six to nine years old. And this um, finding was replicated in another study. So in a way, I believe that this is one beautiful way of showing that early life nutrition is really, really affecting gene expression, and this could have long-term consequences on the health of the offspring. And it certainly behaves like this would be genetic changes. We have been <clears throat> focusing about on other organs. I mean, something that's extremely difficult to study is the placenta, but it seems to be a major, major player also in this field, something that we will come back to some other times, perhaps. Um, these are the people who have been doing these studies. We are still collaborating with this person here, who is David Barker, who made everything possible. We got a huge grant from the British Heart Foundation in 1995 to collect all these data. I believe this is my last slide, so thank you.